Russia's invasion of Ukraine, attacks continue on the country as multiple cities witness elevated attacks by Russian forces, including aerial bombardment. Kharkiv continues to be the worst hit as airstrikes have damaged several buildings in the city. Multiple buildings continue to be on fire. The battle for the Ukrainian capital, meanwhile, has gotten much more intense. A video released by Ukraine shows badly damaged buildings in Kyiv after a Russian airstrike in a town 85 kilometers away from the capital. Civilians have rolled up their sleeves and taken to the streets to prepare road blockades, hedgehogs, metal spikes planted to block or slow Russian advance. Troops are also headed towards the Kaniv hydroelectric power plant near Kyiv. Russians have taken control of the city of Shastia in the Luhansk region in the east. Scenes in that city are that of devastation and destruction. Massive fires seen in many buildings in Hostomel, which is a suburb of Kyiv, after a possible Russian airstrike in the city. Meanwhile, the next round of talks between Russia and Ukraine will be held on Monday, where they are once again going to talk about ceasefires and the safe passage of citizens. Поэтому защищайтесь, иначе она заберет и ваши жизни, и ваши дома. Украина в своих не стреляет. Мы не взрываем жилые дома. И все на Донбассе для нас всегда были и будут украинцами, нашими людьми, нашими гражданами у Донецку. And here I want to play out for you a ground report from what is Ukraine's second largest city but its most attacked urban center at this point of time, the metropolis of Kharkiv, 40 kilometers from the Russian border. This is the city in which an Indian student lost his life, if you remember, just a few days ago. Here's a ground report by a citizen journalist reporting for India today and speaking to a citizen with health issues who's still out there on the streets volunteering to help others. У этого волонтера, у Ирины Белецкой, недавно, недавно было сделано на сердце операция. У нее должна была быть сейчас вторая операция. Ей сейчас очень тяжело ходить и дышать. Но она работает волонтером, и у нее нету даже для себя лекарства купить где-то. Покажи лекарства. Yeah. Вот список лекарств. Ваня, покажи лекарства. Yeah. Не, под цвет, под цвет, под цвет. Uh, she's now, uh, she's now working as a volunteer, even though uh, she can't even properly move or uh, properly even well, uh, function because of the overall weakness. And that's uh, the list of all the medicines she needs, but uh, she can't, well, uh, can't get, not, not может, just afford. Не может сейчас принимать лечение, не может лежать в больнице, она ничего не может. Yes. Она только ждет, когда это все закончится. Yeah, so she's just waiting to, uh, for the work to, to end, to finish her treatment. Yeah, and uh, today uh, we received one of, one of the parcels, one of the... From Great Britain, uh, our friends from Great Britain. Yeah, uh, so one of the deliveries from Great Britain, uh, the, uh, some of the aid for us, Sup uh, supplies, medicine, uh, etc. So, basically good to survive in the city. And here's a report from India Today's foreign affairs editor Geeta Mohan, who has just reached Kyiv. Here's what she did on that train to Kyiv with Ukrainians returning to their capital city to fight for their country. Hardly any people on this train, but this gentleman over here is going back to Kyiv after dropping his godchildren uh, to the border and across to Poland. Thank you for joining over here with India Today. Uh, what's your name? Hi, my actually I have the same name as this uh, crazy mad tyrant who killed our kids, but I call myself Volodya. So you don't want to call yourself Vladimir anymore? No, no I don't want. Okay, that's how bad it is, that he does not even want to call himself as this, the same name as that of the Russian president. Volodym, let's start with that. Volodym, uh, why are you going back to Kiev? And what were you doing when you took your godchildren, your friends? children across the border? Mm, I come back because it's my hard duty, so I don't have an even choice. It's my neighborhood. I was born there, and I'm just uh, put in safe place, uh, my friend's family, 
and come back to fight against uh, Russian crazy terrorists. How difficult has it been for you, your family, I, your, your elders are still in Kiev? Yes, yeah, some of my family, oh no, my family, my sister family, she has four kids and she have a little time, uh, has a little time to go away from Mashun. Now it's near to Gostomel. Uh, her house, I think, is destroyed and uh, more, uh, sto everything stolen from it, uh, but she has chance to go away. My mother lives in Kiev, my grandfather, they are... All very old people could not live without medicine help. Uh, also, all my friends uh, fighting against, uh, try to help who has not opportunity to fight. Your friend is also in the army and you're also going to join the forces? We are not army, we are civilian people. Forces. Civilian, for, forces. For civilian forces. So we don't have experience with uh, war, but uh, we do our best. All eyes are also on that huge, giant, 64-kilometer-long Russian military convoy that's still moving towards the country's capital. Images that the Russian MOD put out yesterday were the first ground images of that convoy, which had so far only been seen from the satellite cameras. Take a look at this image. This convoy is still moving and edging closer to the city. tanks and trucks as far as the eye can see. This mesmerizing bird's eye view of Russia's giant armored convoy rumbling towards Ukraine's capital has become one of the faces of this escalating conflict. But after 10 days of satellite pictures, finally a view from the ground. Images published by the Russian military show the giant convoy up close for the first time. Carefully curated images part of a power projection exercise amidst denials in Kyiv that this convoy has managed to encircle the crucial city. Uh, somebody uh, said that it is just uh, to distract attention of the Ukrainian armed forces to concentrate on that direction and to open another road. The second version is that Russians are trying to regroup because now they have quite a dispersed uh, forces around Kyiv and they are trying to regroup to accumulate the forces that they need for the big strike. In his delusional mind, he does believe so. Uh, that wouldn't be true because uh, even if he pretends to you know, take over Kyiv and claim that, uh, that this is the new ruler, whatever he would, uh, would that would be, uh, that would not change the the will of what a million Ukrainians who are fighting against that right now. But he indeed is trying to encircle the city. Ukrainian army is fighting back. That uh, convoy you are referring to has uh, not been moving for the past five days, I think. So they are not having any way to move forward because of the Ukrainian army. The superior strength of the Russian forces looking to besiege Ukraine's capital has snaked down the highway from the north for several days now. Across bitter, snow-blown wilderness, menacing war machines bearing down on a metropolis that must bend if President Putin is to impose his will on Ukraine. These are the up-close images of the convoy, that Russian convoy that's moving towards the capital, Kiev. Uh, in some places, it's extremely close to Kiev. One information uh, that we have received is, is indicating that a part of that convoy is virtually now on the outskirts of Kiev. The logistics challenge that was being pointed out uh, initially, uh, that seems to have been overcome. The convoy is populated with battle tanks, armoured personnel carriers and utility trucks carrying troops, rations and weapons, perhaps for the long haul. While Kyiv city itself hasn't been damaged much in 10 days, the suburbs and outskirts have been pounded by missiles, shells and rockets for days together. The Hostomel airbase to Kyiv's north has also evidently been overrun by Russian forces. With the giant convoy now looking to encircle and besiege Kyiv from three sides, two questions hover above all else. Will Ukraine's capital fall soon? And if it does, will Russia have crossed a red line that brings NATO and the West finally into this war? With Gaurav Savant in Kyiv and Gita Mohan in Lviv, Bureau Report, India Today.
On day 11 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Putin has clearly set his eyes on capturing the country's many nuclear reactor facilities. Ukraine claims that Russian troops have already captured two Ukrainian nuclear facilities, one of them defunct, which is Chernobyl, and is now advancing towards the third one. According to President Zelensky, Russians have already captured Chernobyl, which is inactive since the 1986 nuclear disaster, but remains staffed and maintained at this point because it's still sensitive. Russians have also taken captivity of the Zaporizhia power plant, which is Europe's largest nuclear power facility. According to Russian media, Kyiv in a sensational claim, has been actively exploring the possibility of uranium mining and enrichment. And the United States could have possibly supplied Ukraine with plutonium suitable for nuclear weapon development. According to sources, Kiev representatives have initiated dialogue with foreign companies on providing assistance to Ukraine in creating its own uranium enrichment enterprises. The bottom line is, some media in Moscow suggest that the Western NATO are trying to turn Ukraine into a weapons country, a nuclear weapons country. Russian troops continue their offensive in Ukraine on the 11th day. Claims and counterclaims have taken center stage. Russia has claimed that they've destroyed more than 2,100 military installations of Ukraine, which includes 74 control points and communication centers of the Ukrainian armed forces, 108 S-300, uh, as well as 68 radar stations. Russia has also claimed to have destroyed 748 tanks and armored vehicles. They've also bombed five radar stations and two Buk M1 anti-aircraft missile systems. Ukraine has also hit back at Russia and claimed that they've seized 30 units of Russian equipment. And joining me live now from Moscow is uh, journalist and analyst Elnar uh, Bainazarov. He's uh, with me from Moscow. Elnar, uh, good to see you. Thanks for being with me. Uh, we uh, value getting voices like yours because we're tracking this story from both sides, from what's happening in Ukraine as well as what's happening in Russia. The first question I want to ask you, uh, Elnar, is how are you reading the situation? We're currently on day 11 what is your understanding of what the next few days will look like? Um, actually, every day, every morning breaks some news, uh, some bad news for all Russians and for all Ukrainian people because um, the economic pressure yes. from the West continues to Russia. And, uh, for example, today uh, all Russians woke up to the announcement by Visa and MasterCard that their yeah. cards won't be legal in Russia very soon and that Visa and MasterCard would withdraw from Russian market and uh, that uh, our cards won't uh, work uh, outside of Russia so everybody is like in panic and like um, some of my friends are currently in ATMs trying to uh, take uh, more dollars uh, if it's possible mm. because uh, nobody knows what's going on and for example some markets some shops uh, they are not allowing people to buy a lot of stuff because uh, they think that the scarcity of market scarcity of the products might come very soon so russians are currently like in a little bit of shock and currently some of them are panicking but most of the russians like most of the population doesn't feel don't feel this pressure and mm -hmm. that's why most of russians are like calm down but young people and people like uh, uh, intellectuals people who are educated and who want to leave russia they are panicking most yes and uh, regarding the military situation regarding what's going on in ukraine and in russian border uh, tonight as we know from the media um, in belgorod uh, which is border town yes. uh, close to the border with ukraine uh, there was some kind of um, situation, some yes. kind of... We have, uh, we have that image, Elnar. I was going to ask my producer to put that image of the bombing, uh, you know, the, the bomb explosion that we saw yeah. in the city of Belgorod. Let's put that on our screens as Elnar is talking about that. Yes, Elnar. 
Yes, and uh, according to mayor of the city, nothing important, nothing very big has happened. It was just kind of small explosion. And, you know, in Russia, yeah, at night it was at night, and uh, in Russia nobody gives uh, like much uh, space to this incident. Uh, and according to the Russian media and according to the mayor of the city, it was not like explosion. It was just some light uh, flash. And uh, nobody in Russia calls it actually explosion because it's illegal. So this is why we call it just uh, like small flash. And no injuries were reported and uh, small damages only reported in one house. But um, since we are in military operation, since we are in like current state of uh, military actions, we can't trust uh, neither to Russia, neither to Ukraine. So we have to recheck this information. Uh, Elnar, you know, coming cu coming back to the uh, uh, the hostilities that are happening on the ground, uh, a lot of nuclear facilities are apparently, uh, you know, under siege in Ukraine right now. Zaporizhia a few days ago, the southern, uh, you know, southern Ukraine nuclear power plant is apparently being approached by Russia. There is a view that the Russian forces are trying to take take control of these four major nuclear power facilities in Ukraine, which supply over half of all electricity in the country, as a means to exert more pressure and exert more control in the country and perhaps to meet more objectives quickly. How do you read that? Um, it's being yeah, called it's Operation Blackout by some. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's true because uh, we can't check with this information because, as I already mentioned, it's war and we don't know which mm. party is lying and which party we have to trust on. But according to Russian sources, according to the Ministry of Defense of Russia, uh, Russia is approaching uh, further to Ukrainian cities and it's taking more and more cities and according to Ukrainian Ministry of Defense that's not true and Ukrainians uh, could fight back and uh, for example right now um, everybody is awaiting massive attacks on Odessa which is the naval and um, naval port of Ukraine and uh, one of the most important on the Black Sea port but um, the city is preparing for the uh, Russian, um, so let's call it invasion, although it's illegal in Russia right now since the state Duma adopted this new law, which uh, makes us um, unable and it's illegal in Russia to call the military operation as war or invasion. And that's why we have to call it only as military operation and we should not oppose this uh, operation in Russia. And actually, today, some protests are going to take place mm. according to some media and social networks. And um, as I'm uh, reaching this news, in Irkutsk, which is the uh, eastern part of Russia, uh, some protests already begun. And uh, in Moscow, some protests are uh, awaited today. But um, nobody knows whether these protests would be massive because um, of this new law, which... Um, um, you could go to jail for 15 years uh, for calling this military operation war or invasion. And um, uh, regarding the Ukraine, regarding this nuclear situation, yes, I guess it could be logical if uh, Russia in its strategy to demilitarize and to neutralize Ukraine could take all these power plants because uh, these power plants are actually um, like points of instability in current situation because um, if these power plants could um, could be taken by some terrorists or could taken by some nationalists who are not agree with Russian policies, uh, it's not only about safety of Ukraine, it's about the safety of Russian European part as well. Because um, as we already mentioned, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is the biggest in Europe and the biggest in Ukraine. And so if something bad could happen to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, it would be a problem not only about Ukraine, it will be a problem Correct. in Russia too. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Elnar, you know, coming back to the first point that you were mentioning, which is very important, you know, by next week, SWIFT financial services, uh, you, know, uh, you know, will be unplugged. You've been talking about all these other uh, companies that have seized operations. Every, you know, with every passing hour, we're hearing about another company that has seized operations or shut its stores or stopped its supply lines or seized trade with Russia. So that sense of isolation and commercial alienation is continuing. By next week, 
uh, you know, with swift financial services unplugging from Russia, common Russians will be, uh, you know, feeling the full force of this war. Um, actually, um, that's not true. That's uh, partially true. But um, in general, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have to clarify that SWIFT will switch off only four banks, which are okay. already under Western sanctions. Mm -hmm. So these are Gazprom Bank uh, and some other banks, uh, WTB Bank, uh, some state-owned banks. But for most of other banks, for example, Tinkoff, Bear Bank and others, there would be no consequences and there would be no shutdown of SWIFT because these banks are not in so harsh uh, list of these sanctions. Mm -hmm. So this is why there would be no consequences for most of Russians, because for most of Russians, um, we use uh, Sberbank and Tinkoff and uh, Raiffeisen and all other banks, which will continue work uh, with SWIFT. So this is why for general, for most of Russians, there would be no consequences regarding this SWIFT. But we all see this news that uh, some uh, Western outlets, some Western shops, uh, companies are uh, getting out from Russia. And this news uh, caused some panic. For example, we saw that IKEA, yeah. uh, IKEA this Swedish uh, producer of the furniture, yes. is already left Russia. It's already closed its shops. Although many of Russian politicians, uh, for example, Dmitry Peskov, the press secretary of president, he told that there, there is no reasons, no grounds for panic because these companies will uh, come back to Russia as soon as uh, things would be established and as soon as something would be understandable. And it seems like logical because these companies, for example, this IKEA, it has 15,000 workers, employees. So this is why it would be like illegal and not logical for IKEA to leave all these um, uh, workers mm. and to suspend its actions in Russia. So I guess, and everybody in Russia has these hopes, that these companies would return to Russia and reopen its shops as soon as the situation would be like stabilized and some understanding of the future of the situation would be uh, more clear. Oh, I know this is a broad question, Elnar, but how are young, you know, what's the sentiment you're sensing among young Russians? You know, companies like Nike and IKEA, like you mentioned, and Apple and so many others, uh, you know, shutting shop, as it were, uh, in Russia for now. Is that a cause of distress or are people largely saying, you know, they'll be back after the war is over? Um, actually, um, among my friends, uh, among students, which I'm starting with, um, we see this kind of uh, little bit of panic mm. because um, people's uh, uh, regular life, people's schedule um, is like not as usual. And uh, in Russia, 8th of March is National Women's Day. It's public holiday. Yeah. And some Russian men, they're trying to find out where to buy presents to their women, mm. their girlfriends. And they are facing these problems because, for example, Zara, H&M, yep. and, other, and so Massimo Dutti, and other uh, shops so with gloves and with uh, other furniture, they are closing. They are already closed in Russia in some parts of cities. And uh, this is why um, it's causing uh, problems. I, I don't say it's major problems because um, still we can buy, for example, some gloves from the Japanese, from the Chinese, uh, from Turkish shops. But um, this H&M, this Zara, Bershka and other shops, people just witnessing that uh, these shops are closing, they are leaving Russian market. And um, among youngsters, among uh, people of my age, I'm 27, it's causing like a little bit of panic. And some people are already discussing that they would uh, prefer to leave Russia mm. for some time because they would like to await these times uh, of instability in some other countries. For example, most of the people uh, living to Armenia, living to neighboring Kazakhstan and um, Georgia, yes. for example, because these countries, uh, we have non-visa regimes with these countries and you can live there without uh, your visa. Right. And to Armenia, for example, you can live even with your domestic passport without your uh, international passport. Right. So this is why many of Russian, for example, IT um, specialists, they are living to the Armenia. Uh, and uh, these countries are quite cheap. Uh, but as we mentioned in my first commentary, uh, some uh, visa and MasterCards, they are 
they already announced that they, uh, Russian cars won't work outside of Russia. So uh, right now, some of my friends who are leaving to Armenia, right. they are trying to reach ATMs to find dollars to uh, go and take these dollars to Armenia. One final question, uh, Elnar, and we very much appreciate your time, uh, is about the Russian oligarchs. You know, we've seen images of some of those super luxury yachts being confiscated. The British government has talked about moving against, uh, you know, these oligarchs with Kremlin links in Europe as well. Uh, uh, what's been the reaction to that? Because, uh, you know, I know uh, that the outside world tends to oversimplify what is essentially a very complicated issue. But there is a sense that the oligarchs may turn against Putin. Is that, is that anywhere close to being true as the pressure piles up? Um, actually, as a journalist, as, uh, I cannot confirm this information mm. because we don't know that these oligarchs are really thinking because we don't see this in public. Yeah. But um, uh, some Russians, some Russian media stars, some Russian uh, stars among the bank industry, they already announced that um, these sanctions are catastrophe yeah. and this military operation is catastrophe to Russian economy and uh, it's catastrophe itself. So um, we don't know what these oligarchs are thinking, but uh, we saw what, for example, um, Mr. Chichvarkin, who is uh, the founder of Beeline, one of the, uh, uh, no, he is the founder yes. of the um, network of uh, mobile phone shops. Uh, he already announced that this war, this military operation is a catastrophe to all Russians and um, life that we used to won't be uh, possible to live this life uh, further. So um, I don't know what these oligarchs are really thinking, but um, as we have seen already that uh, yesterday, uh, the government of Italia, the authorities of Italia, they uh, have um, taken the villas of uh, the Russian media representatives uh, and Russian oligarchs right. who were residing in Italy. And uh, by some people in social networks, by some Russians, uh, it was uh, discussed as the only good news we are receiving these days. Because, right. mm, yes, among Russian population, these oligarchs, they don't have much popularity. Mm. And when we see this news about uh, the confiscating of villas and yachts, most of the Russian people, most of the Russian population, they are greeting this news with cheers because mm -hmm. that's the only good news we are approaching these days. Stay safe, uh, uh, Elnar. Good to always have you here. Uh, these are very, very difficult times. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no combat happening in Moscow, but the effects of this war definitely being felt in Russia as well. So we'll keep coming back to you. Very much appreciate your insight and your commentary on a rapidly developing situation that's affecting all parts of the world. Elnar uh, is reporting from Moscow, giving us an insight into an ever-changing situation. The most defining images from day one to day 11 that we will always project and capture for you here on India Today because pictures are telling this story more than anything else. Amidst a storm of claims and counterclaims, the images don't lie.